Dennis, for that. Let's go to Psalm chapter 71. I think the middle of the Bible is Psalm 118, so split your Bible and have to be close. It'll be right around Psalm 71. Well, that was a beautiful psalm, wasn't it? It takes a lot for me to cry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll tell you that that was a good one. Like that. It's so true. I was, uh, I heard some things earlier in the, well, you know, Sunday's the first day of the week, so it didn't last week. Just some, some folks kind of disparaging Christ. And, um, well, you know, if you don't know the Lord, then you don't know what it's all about. And uh, it certainly can change your life. I was thinking about that verse he was, well, he was singing to you that kind of mentioned in that song. <clears throat> Over in, you don't have to go there, First John chapter, I think it's chapter, chapter 1. Yeah. Is, uh, this is First John 1 7 if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin isn't that good I'm glad that that's true because I have a lot of sins I need to be cleansed from and to be honest still do so the blood still has power to do that well you know we've been in this series in First Peter and uh Kind of took a break from that. I got captured by something in Psalm 71, and I thought I'd share it with you. We might, we'll probably, well, next week I may preach a July the fourth message, even though it'll be July the fifth, which is Major's birthday and Vanessa, my sister's birthday, next Sunday. So anyway, I'll probably preach it. July 4th message. But any, uh, so we were preaching uh, about 1 Peter, about how to survive the storm. But I got captured by something in Psalm 71. I don't really, Joseph asked me for the title. I don't really know what the title is. I told him three great ways to practice your faith. Whatever, I don't know. Um, but I do think there's a couple things in Psalm 71 that'll, that'll help us. And let me kind of start by saying this. You read about or hear about sometimes people who leave the faith. So I read a few weeks ago or a month ago about some prominent uh, Christian singer who had renounced his faith. And I guess his dad was a preacher or something. And he eventually said he didn't believe in God, didn't believe the Bible anymore and all that. So there are people who we might say they forsake the faith, they fall away, they, they, uh, they renounce it, whatever. I remember reading years ago about Ted Turner, you know, the, the entertainment mogul, and uh, I don't know if this is true or not, I tried to verify, it's hard to kind of verify everything you read anymore, there's so many different accounts of things, but his, he did have a sister, a little, a younger sister that died when she was young, and, and he had prayed for her, and she wasn't healed, and so he, uh, he got disillusioned with his faith. He was part of the church as a young person, and his family was. And um, after she died, he became disillusioned with the Lord. And and years later, he had told someone or somebody had quoted him as saying that he said the best thing that ever happened to him was when he got away from the church. The best thing that ever happened. And you know, it's not unusual for people to be disappointed with God. God doesn't work out like you think He should, or God doesn't do what you think He should. Uh, you know, to become kind of disillusioned with how things are in the world. I know there's a lot of people that they're, they argue against God's existence. If He was, you know, if God was real, why did kid children suffer, you know? If he was real, you know, why is this or that? And then quite, to be quite honest, we don't know all the answers to that. I preached about that a while back. But I do think it's interesting in Psalm 71, the very first verse, 
what the psalmist says. And many believe that Psalm 71 is a continuation of Psalm 70. If you, if you have it open, Psalm 70 just has a few verses there, five verses. And it does seem to flow with Psalm 70. So it's likely that David wrote Psalm 71, although we don't know. And you can look, and every, every commentator has a different idea. But in Psalm 71, it begins like this. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. And that's in our King James. The word confusion is its interesting. It's, it's uh, translated a lot of different ways. But one of the ways it's translated is disappointed. You know, here's the way I want to translate it. Don't, don't ever let me regret that I trust you. And the psalmist is just saying, Lord, I don't want to get to the end of my road and look back and say, man, I made a mistake. I should have been following this. I should have been following something else. I should have been like those people who just eat, drink, and be merry. And live like they want to. Because, you know, the Lord has just been a big disappointment. And it's not as if this is... Uh, a single case of the Bible. If you flip back a few pages to Psalm 31, we have almost the identical thought in verse number 1 of Psalm 31. He uses a little different word, but it has the exact same kind of connotation. In Psalm 31, verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. I'm ashamed I did that. I'm ashamed. He says, Deliver me in thy righteousness. As I was thinking about that, really there's something else in this passage that really grabbed hold of me, but I just got to thinking about it. You know, it's, it's interesting that people sometimes regret or they have remorse over all kinds of things, but it's really sad when a person has remorse over their faith. Like this young person I read. Matter of fact, in our songbook, we have a, we have a wonderful song that we sing every once in a while when I'm leaving the singing. <laughs> and that's a passion for thee. I mean, an absolutely beautiful song. Uh, I think I thought it was 47, 371 maybe, but anyway, the guy who wrote that song, I was gonna read a little bit to you. Yeah, listen to this song. He says, set my heart, O dear Father, on thee and the only. Give me a thirst for thy presence divine. Lord, keep my focus on loving thee holy. Purge me from earth, turn my heart after thine. A passion for thee. Set my set a fire in my soul and a thirst for my God. The person who wrote that song at one point was a what we would consider a fundamentalist, a person who was committed to the fundamentals of his faith, and he went and has went to the opposite spectrum. He hasn't, I don't think, given up on God, but he's certainly practicing his faith in a way that is that is uh, quite different than what he used to. And probably if he was honest, and I've read some of the some of his articles that he's written after he did this, he kind of regretted that he was ever part of that movement of people who kind of followed God in more of a, I don't know, more an outward commitment or something. I don't, I don't know how to put it. Well, the, 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 the situation here is, is that the psalmist is just, not wanting to regret that he gave his life to God. He doesn't want to get to the end, you know, where he's to the end of his destination and, and figure out he's in the wrong place. He had the wrong purpose. He followed the wrong promise. The journey that he took was just for nothing. I mean, the psalmist says that, even he even says those words in, a, in another psalm. I can't think of which psalm it is offhand. But he basically says, have I done all this for bang, for nothing? And, you know, I, I introduced this three great ways to practice your faith. The very first phrase there, he says, in thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. And we could add, I put my trust in thee, O Lord, absolutely, completely. My life, God, is in your hands. So don't disappoint me, Lord. Don't let me down. 
Don't leave me high and dry. Don't leave me stranded somewhere, Lord. I'm trusting in you that you will not disappoint me because I've given you my life. You know, you only have one life. And, and interesting, as I get older, here's what I found out about my life. I haven't. I wish I'd have known now, back then what I know now. I wish to God I had some sense well, 20 years ago. Man, I look back and I, I did so many things that I wish I would have just had more sense about. But the psalmist, he's giving his life, he's giving his future, all of his plans to God. And, and even though you, know, you, you, you live your life, you get one chance at it, and there's some things you can't rewind. You can't go back and undo it. You make a massive mistake, you know, 20 years ago, and that, that mistake, it hounds you and rides you the rest of your life. You can't do anything about it other than just try to get over it. You know, I heard some ladies talking in a thrift store this week. They were talking about someone had passed away, and the lady said to the other one, you never get over it, you learn to live with it. Isn't that the truth? That's just the truth. You never get over those mistakes. You live with it. I wish to God I'd have done some things different. And the psalm says, God, please, at the end of my life, don't let me get there and turn back and say, I wish to God I'd have hitched my cart to somebody else. Sometimes I tell Tammy that. I say, Tammy, you probably would have been better to hitch your cart to somebody else. Is this all you're going to get? She's always sweet enough, Tammy. I like your card. <laughs> but you know what? I want to make sure, and I don't want to get to the end of life thinking I hitched my cart to the wrong one, to this Bible that's been taught to me that it's the truth. No matter what the heathen or the world or the skeptic, or the agnostic, or the atheist says about it, I hitch my cart to the truth, and I get to the end of my life, and I look back and say, wow, I hitched my cart to the wrong one. I lived my life the wrong way. I could have been a heathen. I could have went out there and done all those things that all the lost people do, and, and nothing's ever going to happen to. I could have done my own will instead of God's will. The psalmist is saying this in a nutshell. I just don't want to regret following you, God. I want you to kind of stay with me. There are people today that struggle just as the psalmist thinking maybe there's another way to live. So I was up at Dollar General the other day. This is deeper in my sermon, but I'll, I'll go ahead and throw it out there. And uh, I don't know, we stopped there after church, we needed something, and I can't remember what it was, but uh, the little girl there was a checkout, and uh, she just kind of set off the cuff, she said, I get off in about 15 minutes. I said, really? Well, that's great. I said, I just got off work. She looked at me and she said, you just got off work? I said, yeah. She said, you look like you just came from church. <laughs> I said, well, I did. I just came from church. I said, but I preach. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the preacher. I had to work. She got a kick out of that. So I asked her, I said, well, where do you attend church? She said, oh, I don't go to church anymore. She said, I went to church when I was a kid. But she said, I'm growing up now. I don't need church. That, that's for when I was a kid. I said, oh, okay. I said, well. That's the way some people think. Do you ever regret that you gave God your life, your future, your family, how you raised your kids? You can raise your kids the world's way or God's way. Do you regret that? I don't regret it. I will say this. I took a lot of heat over it. I took a lot of heat from it within my own family and other people saying I was too hard on my kids or I sheltered my kids. Let me tell you something. If you're a parent of a kid, you are their shelter. Amen? Somebody's got to shelter them. 
God help them if they don't have a shelter. Well, when I get to the end of my road, I don't want to turn back and say, Lord, I trusted in you to take care of my family. You told me how to raise my kids. I raised them like you told me. Man, I regret it now. You give him your future. You give him your family. You give him your finances. You know, I was thinking the other day, if I didn't tithe and give my money to the church, I could pay my house off in just a few years. I start dancing. <laughs> You know, you give the Lord your money and you think, well, man, if I didn't give God my money, I could be driving a nicer vehicle. Yeah, maybe. I remember a brother, I have Tammy, I know, I know my father's law's name is the same as mine, okay, which is odd. And my dad's name was Ivan. Three Ivans all in one little, little circle. I remember brother Ivan used to say, Oh, so and so's in the hospital getting his tithe taken out. <laughs> I used to get a kick out of it. But you know, you give the Lord your finances, and when you when you give your money to the church, it's it's not you're not you're just giving it to the Lord. He chooses really in the end how it all works out. But you're just trusting God with your finances, with your check. With trust God with your physical life, His care over you, His commitment to you, His concern for you. It just boils down to you're following God because you believe it's the right way to go. Oh, Ted Turner, if it's true what they say that he said the best thing that ever happened to him was to go a different way. You know, if you're in the Psalms still, go to Psalm 107. I mentioned this in a devotion a while back. But in Psalm 107, down in verse number uh, 7, it says, He led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city of habitation. And remember, that Psalm 107 is, is about ways. There's the solitary way. That's the, the, the desolate way. And there's the right way. And then there's no way over verse number 40. But, but the psalmist here, he's just saying, You know, Lord, I'm trusting you completely because I think it's the right way. You're going to lead me to the right place at the end of my life, and, and I'm going to have, have accomplished the right purpose with what you've given me, and I'm going to have practiced the right principles that you've showed me in the Bible, and, and you put me on the right path. And I pray for my kids sometimes that, that they'll just stay on the right path. I like Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 8. I mention it often, but Proverbs 4, verse 8, the, the Bible says this, the, the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more into the perfect day. And you know, so the psalmist here, listen, he, he's trusting God completely with his future, his family, his finances, his physical life, just following him, and he's saying, you know what, it's just the right way to go. He's the right one. It's the right way. He has the right will for my life. It's the right way, but it's the best way. It's the best possible way that could happen to anybody is following what God has for your life. It's not the easiest way, I can assure you of that. It's not the softest way, but it is the best way for us to go. It's the right way. It's the best way. It's God's way. It's it's what God designed me for. It's amazing to me. If you know Tammy and I's story, and why God chose me to do what I do, and Tammy to, to be alongside me. I often wonder, and I often talk to the Lord about it, and say, Lord, you know, why did you choose me to be the preacher in the family? And give me such a wonderful wife and wonderful kids. I mean, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me was when I met the Lord and He changed my life and He put me on a path and I've just been going down it. It's God's way for my life. God prepared me up to do what I do today. I can remember when I was young, people saying, your mouth's going to get you into trouble. <laughs> I'm 
sorry. <laughs> but you know, God's way is God's perfect design for you. His perfect direction. His perfect decree for your life. And you know, Tammy, before we ever met, Tammy used to pray for God to, to protect her future husband. And, and boy, did I ever need protecting. But the psalmist just gets to the end of the road and he says, you know what, I just don't want to have some regrets wishing I would have went another way. So we see that in the media. They, they always highlight stories of people who forsake the Lord or who give up their faith, and they basically say, you know, well, I wish I would have never got involved in that. But I'll tell you, God, God doesn't disappoint us. Now, we may be disappointed because of a faulty theology, but we shouldn't have any regrets. And when you trust God completely, let me tell you, you're just trusting Him with everything. And you're just praying and trusting and believing that God is going to do what He says He's going to do. And so the psalmist says, you know what, I have no regrets. I thought about the, the, the three Hebrew children over in Daniel. If you flip over to Daniel, if you would, you go to... Psalm, Proverbs, a few, then you'll hit Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel. In Daniel chapter 3, we have that story. Y'all just stay with me. You have the story of the three Hebrew children. You remember that? You learned it in Sunday school years ago. These three uh, Hebrew young people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember those? And Nebuchadnezzar, well, let me just read. So it says, well, let me, let me read you the decree. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, his breadth, breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the province, to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, all the rulers of the province were gathered together in the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. And they stood before the image of Nebuch that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at the time when all the people heard the music, all the people, the nations, the languages, they fell down and they worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews, and they said to the king, Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man shall at the sound of the music fall down and worship you, the golden image, and whoso falleth not down shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring them, and I'm skipping some stuff for the sake of time, bring them before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if you be ready at what time you hear the, the music, then you need to... to uh, fall down and worship the image which I made. But if you worship not, you shall be cast in the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is the God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, and here's what they said, and our King James says, to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee in this matter. And interesting, in the, the translation of the we are not careful to answer thee, it means this. We don't have any anxiety to tell you 
this answer. We're not worried about it. We're not overly burdened because of what we have to say. And here's what they say. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver you, to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we're not going to serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. I want you to stay with me. Here's basically what they're saying. God may not do what we think He's going to do. And God may not always work out like I want Him to work out. But I want you to know, world, I'm not going to bow down and worship the world and worship the images of a false god and follow a false god because God is right. And whether He saves me or kills me, I'm still going to follow God. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to give out. I'm just going to keep going for God. And you know what? I'm not going to regret it. And that's basically what it's saying. We're not going to regret this. If God kills us, we don't regret it. And you know the story. God didn't kill them. And they turned that furnace up seven times harder than it ever had been, and they threw them in, and the guys who threw them in were consumed by the heat. And there was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walking around, and nothing, not a hair on their head was, was burned. The only thing that was burned was the, was the ropes that bound them. It says when they came out of the fire, they didn't even have the smell. They didn't even smell like they'd been in the smoke. But they said this, I've hitched my cart to God. And I'm going to follow Him to the end. And I'm not going to regret it. And I'm telling you, hey, listen, you may be disappointed. And you may at times not understand what God's doing. But, but hear me, God is not going to let you down. <coughs> not going to forsake you. And those old three Hebrew children, you know, they came out of that fire and they came out just as healthy as can. You know, when we trust God completely, it's with no regrets, but it's really with, with no retreats. I'm not going to retreat when things are going bad and I don't understand it. And, you know, I've said it many times. My youngest son, Major, got cancer when he was a kid and we didn't understand it, but I didn't give up on my faith. My mother was killed in an accident. That broke my heart. I wish she was sitting in this auditorium this morning hearing me preach. But we don't retreat in those bad times. We don't regret that we followed God. God gives us no reason to back out of our faith. Let me, let me read you another verse out of Joshua. Joshua chapter 20, some 23 I think it is, verse 14. Listen to what it says. Behold, this day I'm going the way of all the earth. Joshua's going to die. He says, and you know in all of your hearts and all of your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord God spoke to you concerning you. All of them have come to pass of you. Not one thing has failed thereof. God doesn't give us a reason to be disappointed. We shouldn't have regrets. We shouldn't retreat. We should just trust God completely and keep going. Now that's hard to do, I understand, and I'm not saying it's easy. You remember the song you used to sing in Vacation Bible School? I remember. I love it. What was that? Uh, what's that one song when you're marching in? Awkward Christian. I love that one because I told you as soon as they start hearing that, I think about cookies and Kool-Aid. 
As soon as that's over, I get cookies and go Amen. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a dog and did them experience when they met that the dog salivates. <laughs> well, anyway, there's another song. I have decided to follow Jesus. You remember that song? I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. Though none go with me. Decided to follow Jesus. Listen to this little hymn story about that. It says this hymn was originated, it originated in, in Assam, India. According to, if it gives a person's name, the lyrics are based on the last words of Nok Sin. Nok Sin. N O K S E N G. A Garo man, a tribe from Mega. Megalalia, I don't want to butcher in this, which was then in a song, who converted to Christianity in the middle of his in the middle of the 19th century through the efforts of an American Baptist missionary. He is said to have recited verses from the 12th chapter of the book of John as he and his family were killed. He, he was saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. As they killed him in his pain. Can I tell you this, this morning that the devil is going to want you to have some regrets about living right. My neighbor over there has got a big boat, lives in a house twice as big as I do, never goes to church. That ain't your business. That's God's business. Yeah, you do, you do what you know you're supposed to do. Well, boy, those kids over there, they're never disciplined. They're never done. You know, their parents don't, don't ever do it. And look at them. I understand that. But you do what you know you're supposed to do. Don't, don't regret living for God. I was going to read you that song and we'll go home, which I'm pretty sure it's in our book here. I'll say that. I'll get here and it won't be in our book. <clears throat> yeah, it's on page 635. I thought it was in our book. Let's look at that. We'll read it and we'll just... I never did get to the part of the song.